You can't die in Svalbard. You can't be born either. Lungyrbien is a coal mining town whose mines have recently closed. It's the only permanent settlement in a Norwegian archipelago in the Arctic Circle called Svalbard and is the northernmost town in the world. In Lungyrbien, an influx of scientists has begun replacing local miners, propping up a zombie economy with international research grants. Researchers arrive here in perfect irony to study the Anthropocene. As all the Arctic coal mined during uh, all the Arctic coal mined since 1901 combusted, atmospheric carbon dioxide levels rose, and the glaciers whose tongues and feet and snouts had waxed and waned along the depressed arets of Svalbard for hundreds of thousands of years receded. Their mass balances shifted, they calved and let loose, and the temperatures rose, and the waters rose, unleashing a terrible positive feedback cycle. What will happen as these glaciers recede, as the climate warms, and as ecological catastrophe joins geopolitical cat catastrophe to make this and every other place precarious and unlivable? To find out, I flew to Lungyrbien. Less than a thousand mile, a uh, thousand kilometers, excuse me, from the North Pole, over 60% of Svalbard's landmass is covered by glaciers. Permafrost renders the ground nearly impenetrable. In the 18th century, Russian trappers would leave their dead above ground throughout the winter as the earth only softened enough to bury them in spring. And once a body is buried, Arctic temperatures keep it from decomposing. If buried above permafrost, as in the example above me, the thawing ground eventually forces bodies back up until they surface again. So the dead remain fresh, just below the frozen earth, perpetually waiting to be disinterred. My second story attends to a different sort of condensed vital potential awaiting resurrection, literal seeds. In 2003, the World Bank allocated $13.6 million to update 11 gene banks, which collectively held over 600,000 agricultural genetic resources. Most, mostly when I say uh, genetic resources, I'm referring to land races. In 2005, just when the gene banks had been um, finally updated, Hurricane Katrina hit. And researchers began to wonder um, whether agricultural diversity could ever be secure in cities that were vulnerable to ecological disaster. They realized that gene banks were located in places that could be quickly dismantled by different kinds of geopolitical strife and natural disaster. Uh, such gene banks included Nigeria, Colombia, and Nepal. Now, years earlier, Norwegian scientists suggested burying a gene bank here in a Lungyrbian coal mine. A vault dug into the permafrost in Svalbard suddenly seemed as safe a place as any, and perhaps safer than most. A thin cement wedge piercing the frozen mountainside at a steep incline, the vault's brutalist exterior suggests how deeply it is rooted beneath the earth. Above the doors and along the roof is an installation of prisms and fiber optic cables that reflect the midnight sun in the summer and glitter like the aurora borealis in the middle of the polar night. It looks like a science fictional post-apocalyptic bunker, which is, in fact, exactly what it is. At first, the Doomsday Vault seems to keep a kind of evangelical time. What I mean by that is millennial anticipation oscillates between apocalypse and salvation, with nothing in between. Millenarians either welcome Doomsday with open arms, or they stockpile beef jerky and Bitcoin, and sometimes they do both. The point 
is that the end is nigh, and the present has been reduced to a horizon in which to anticipate the end of days. This notion sounds somewhat like Walter Benjamin's point about perpetual catastrophe supplanting dialectical history. But more importantly, it is also the pervasive attitude of our times. Just turn on the news. The vaults engineers have prepared for a day when the permafrost has thawed. They've accounted for a 70 meter sea level rise, which is a rough estimate of what would happen if every single glacier in the world were to melt. They compounded that scenario with a tsunami, and then they built the vault five stories above that predicted waterline. Engineers calculate that given the current rate of climate change, the vault would remain below freezing, that is naturally below freezing, even if the electricity were out for the next two centuries. How long did you build it to, to last, I asked my guide. Essentially forever. So allow me to escort you deeper into the vault. The door to vault number two is overgrown with frost, which has crystallized around the door frame and bloomed across the door ha handle. My guide opens the door, and minus 18 degrees Celsius is a sucker punch. Yet here is abundant life. 860,000 different varieties of crops and 120,000 different strains of rice alone. Seeds are sealed in triple-ply, puncture-resistant vacuum packaging and are then loaded into plastic crates, which are stacked on shelves. Looking inside one box, I find ampules of squash and bags of anise. Every major crop in the world is in this room. Not just wheat, oats, barley, potatoes, lentils, soybeans, and alfalfa, but also heirloom seeds and forgotten land races. Boxfuls of foraged grasses are stored cheek by jowl alongside sorghum, foxtail millet, burr clover, purple bush beans, pigeon peas, Kentucky bluegrass, and creeping beggarweed. Every country in the world is represented, as are several countries that no longer exist. Colombia, North Korea, Russia, Taiwan, Ukraine, Switzerland, Nigeria, Germany, Israel, Syria, Zimbabwe, Tajikistan, and Armenia share shelf space in this pastoral League of Nations. On February 26, 2008, the day the seed vault opened, Pakistan and Kenya were first in line to store their seeds. The previous year, the disputed election of Mwaikibaki in Kenya triggered ethnic violence against the Kikuyus. Karachi had catastrophically flooded and was also seen to a bloody suicide bombing. And Benazir Bhutto was assassinated in the streets of Rawalpindi. Perhaps for Kenya and Pakistan, a cache in the seed vault is a way to refuse political and climatological vulnerability or even to forecast a future that might sustain life. I notice that one shelf of the vault is half empty. Four years into the civil war and humanitarian crisis in Syria, violence barreling northwards toward Aleppo jeopardized the headquarters for, international for the International Center for Agricultural Research in the Dry Areas which is thankfully um, has an acronym, or it's called ICARDA. Hundreds of thousands of seeds were banked in ICARDA, including some of the earliest strains of Levantine wheat and durum, many of them more than 10,000 years old. Now, in an Aleppo summer, a power outage would thaw these seeds much faster than would one in Svalbard, so ICARDA shipped the seeds to Svalbard for safekeeping. The Syrian gene bank, now relocated to Morocco and Lebanon, recently requested 30,000 samples from its originary, original collection to help rebuild the country's stores of barley, lentils, and chickpeas.
Like the viruses that are thick on and under the ground in Svalbard, the vault condenses multiple temporalities. These are places in which some subcutaneous latent life, a virus, a seed, erupts into the present or is buried for future use. Coldness synthesizes and reassembles biological time. Following theorist Deepesh Chakrabarty, latent life in Svalbard is a sort of time knot that refers us to the plurality that inheres in the now, the lack of totality, the constant fragmentariness that constitutes one's present. The 1918 flu is a specter of the past that has erupted into our present. The seeds in the Svalbard Global Seed Vault are artifacts of our present that are now buried for future disinterral. I suggest that the temporalities in which things in the Arctic Circle move or don't move, and the speed at which they do or do not do so, is itself a principle by which things can transition from life to immortality. Some life is slower than molasses on a snow day. Some life is stuck in the past, and much of that old life is durable in its endurance, perpetually present in the present. It lags, it persists. Latent life promises to last forever, even as it is perpetually endangered. It can be patient as a saint, it can be quiet to the point of cryptic. This fact points us to the possibility that rather than being the common denominator underlying all living things, life is perpetually a problem of temporal discontinuities. Viruses and seeds that are stilled in states of suspended animation are classed as only problematically alive, but not quite dead, not quite dead yet. Biding their time, awaiting resurrection, they are pervaded nonetheless by a potent and vital potentiality.